Welcome back to Macno 2021, supporting an equitable trade. We are now joined by the infamous and the magnificent Mark Levinson. He has been in the hobby since 1998, blogging his experiences about his own reef on his website. He's been helping everyone around the world in so many different ways. Most recently, he's become an online personality with tens of thousands of followers on his YouTube channel. You might have seen just a few hundred of his videos. Here to have a discussion with me about, you know what, I want to stock my aquarium. How do I start? Is Mark Levinson. Mark, welcome to Magna 2021. Woohoo! Yay, we're here. I feel like I'm in the room with you. <laughs> you are. <laughs> you know, I, I want to come visit you one day. I was so close so many times. We've been through Dallas. We had Mac at 2012 there. Yeah. And you were busy. I was less busy back then. But, oh, you know, you just can't say, hey, Mark, can I come over after Mac? Because Mac is like an entire week when it's in person. But, Mark, yeah. I, I wanted to have this discussion with you. Um, we, I'm sure you get this a lot. I get this a lot. People, they want to stock the aquarium, their first aquarium, and they don't know where to begin. So, right. Mark, where do we begin? Well, the first thing you should probably do before you do anything is your research. And that would be make a list of the things you want before you spend a dollar, before you even buy the aquarium. Seriously, I would just hold off and I would focus on a game plan, basically, you know, some kind of a spreadsheet or a, a list where you could ask other people, do you think these fish would interact properly? Because the more information you have before you spend a dollar, the more likely you'll have success and the less likely you'll end up having fish losses due to squabbling or incompatibilities or uh, just outright failures. Because again, you need to be educated on what your tank needs specifically to keep these animals alive. And we'll talk about fish a lot, but I feel like we're gonna delve into corals too because we're talking about stocking a reef tank and that's kind of top to bottom. Yeah, yeah, certainly. I think you know something that just came to mind is potentially even looking up where your local club is. And then before you even have the, the tank, the physical glass, go to a meeting, go to four meetings, go to six yeah. meetings, learn as much as you can or join those forums. I know you love forums. It's so hard to do meetings these days. I mean, I know some clubs are doing it. My own club is not. We, um, I just, we're waiting. <laughs> we need COVID to go away. We need the, the solution globally and locally. And that way we can actually gather in groups because I mean, every single day, there's another news story about another outbreak with a small group of people in the same room, some vaccinated, some not, some with masks, some without, some with windows open, some windows closed, people six feet apart, people shaking hands, having barbecues in the backyard, and they're still getting sick. So it's like, I just don't Bump feel elbows. safe. Bump I know, elbows. right? No, I'm like, literally, I don't want to touch the screen right now. <laughs> but no, I mean, it, it's so it is a little bit risky. But online you can definitely communicate with a lot of people you can use a club forum to interact you can use facebook groups to interact you can um uh, delve into masna's library of information as well uh, you can go to milo's reef i have a lot of information that's there to help new hobbyists to be successful i mean that's the whole point of the website i i started that website because i was sick of looking for answers mm. and where a lot of my answers came from was attending the very first magna in 2002 and oh. after I learned from 15 speakers in three days, so much information, I found myself saying constantly on the forums, I learned this at Macna and -da -da -da, start typing. And then the next person had a question. I was like, I heard at Macna, -da -da -da, I started typing. And I just kept doing that because I finally had answers. And then, of course, they'd get lost in these threads. And so that's why I started writing articles on my website where I could just point to an entire body of information with no, inter no interruptions no distractions, and you can just read it and decide for yourself if you believed it or not. So there's potentially a lot of good places to start and get information. There's a lot of different ways to start too, you know, whether you want a, a tank that's specific to one ocean or one sea, if you want a tank of a certain color, you want a tank of a, of a certain type, you know, with fish only, or maybe with just some sort of uh, soft corals. Once we find these resources uh, to figure out what we want, you know, how do we go about kind of figuring out in what order we add it and, and how do we go about starting that process? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, when it comes to introducing livestock, I kind of have a general rule of thumb that's called the reef timeline. So there is that video on my YouTube channel. Just Google that and take you to that one. And kind of, I don't know, it's probably 45 minutes long, maybe longer. <laughs> but it just takes you through like the 24 month period of the first, you know, starting your tank up and what you should expect month after month after month. And when you should turn on lights, when you should try to start a refugium, when it's time for a reactor. Should you start dosing immediately or should you, I mean, all of those things are covered in that. But when it comes to stocking, 
we want to make sure the tank is suitable for livestock in the first place. So I'm going to encourage you to take your time, set up your tank, make sure that all of the uh, parameters seem to be measuring consistently week after week. Uh, if you did the old school method of cycling, you're going to wait a month anyway before you even put the first thing alive that's in that tank. And these are good things. There's no reason to rush any of this. And then when it, what is the first fish you'd put in? That's going to be kind of a debate of what you want to have long term because it's not a damsel, might, a little blue devil. Well, that's what I was going to say. You might want to start <laughs> off with a damsel because those are very hardy and they can they they live forever. I mean, <laughs> they are the fish that you buy in the beginning and you have it for the rest of your reefing career. But there are other fish that would work that are prettier, I think, than a damsel and less aggressive, mostly. And that would be clownfish. Clownfish are very popular. And they're a really good start. They're actually in the same type of family, basically. And they can handle a lot of abuse. Even as you're making mistakes as a new hobbyist, they can endure a lot. But uh, still, stability is really important for your aquarium. And that includes maintaining proper salinity all the time, week after week after week, and maintaining temperature no matter what's happening in your home or outside year round. So like right now, this last week for me with my tank, the AC unit went out. I woke up, the house was too hot. The tank was hotter than the house and it was going to be, you know, hundred degrees outside. And I immediately called the AC company who didn't even come till 6 PM. So my tank, my house got to 85 and my tank was trying to get to 81. And I was going to the uh, local 7-Eleven to buy bags of ice and putting huge bags of ice in my reef tank and floating them until they'd melt in 10 minutes flat, but it would drop the tank temperature one degree. And so I never, ex I never went higher than 80.7 during a very stressful time that whole day. I mean, it was so hot in here. And so if you have a, an aquarium in your home, you obviously think your temperature is always gonna be stable all the time, but things can go wrong. And if you put a tank in your office because you're like, I love this, I need it. Some offices turn off the AC on the weekend and the tank is baking in a very hot building because they're saving money because there's no reason to cool this whole room because no one's there except for all your livestock. <laughs> so we wanna make sure that the environment the tank is in is protected 365 days a year. And we wanna be prepared for heating and cooling needs as well. But once you've got that locked in, then you know, like I said, clownfish could be a, a nice addition to your tank as a nice starting point. But you have to also keep in mind, there are some rules. So for example, some people say, well, there's like 30 different kinds of clownfish. I wanna get one of each. And I'm going to tell you, no, do not do that because they will fight and they will, some, many of them will lose and some will jump out and it's not going to work out. So typically you want to look at which kind of clownfish you want. And then I recommend just getting a pair and letting them just be a pair in the tank. And that's the pair. Now you might say, well, I'm getting an 800 gallon tank. I can do way more than that. Not really. <laughs> I have a friend who had an 800 gallon reef tank and she had four pairs of different clowns all laying eggs and in the end only one pair survived they attacked every other pair of clowns in the tank so it didn't work they had to actually remove all the other pairs and put them in other aquariums just to keep them safe and let them continue to make eggs and you know make baby clownfish because she liked to breed them so even having a huge tank doesn't guarantee success if you decide I want lots of clownfish, Mark, you can't stop me. Then my recommendation is going to be find someone that's a local breeder, if at all possible. If not, you can go through, you know, your fish store, but you want to, you want to go up the food chain to whoever is breeding that clownfish you want and ask them for X amount of the exact same clutch of eggs. That's about six months old. So basically you'd want all the clownfish they have that are one inch in size that are about six months old from the same family, from the same mom and dad. And that's the, you want those babies because they're siblings and they will actually tolerate each other way better than trying to grab a couple of Picassos and a couple of Percula and a couple of cinnamons and a couple of bullet hole and a couple of, you know, I mean, you just, people try to do it and it doesn't work long-term. And you have, I think, uh, some skunks behind you as well. Is that right? I do. I have 11 skunks. They were, and by the way, I do want to mention, I don't want to neglect to mention <laughs> captive bred fish is yes. a great way to go. And so in the case of these, these came from sustainable aquatics and they are involved in not just taking fish out of the ocean. They are actually trying to get them in a sustainable way. And that way, when you're getting theirs, 
you're you're doing a good thing for the oceans. And it's really important to not um, just try to get wild caught fish all the time because there's a lot of issues that can come up with that. So captive bred fish is something you have to specifically ask for. There's no 100% guarantee that's what you're getting unless you know everyone involved. Again, so if you back went up to the store chain. and asked them, you know, I want a captive bred clownfish, what are, you know, what are they going to potentially say? That's that's the question. What are they going to say? Yeah. Oh, like, oh, these are captive bred. So what you need to do is say, where are they from? When did you get them? What's the name of the company? Because it would be really nice to get some backstory. Maybe you can even look up that company and find out more about them and see if it's really the same ones. Because the, you might see a pair in the fish store you absolutely are in love with. Mm -hmm. I mean, it happens. We all see something like, oh my God, I need to have that. It's so cute. And so you want to buy it, but then you look on their website. They don't even sell that fish. They don't even make that fish. It's not. <laughs> so, you know, it's a possibility that you will not be told the truth, whether it's voluntarily misleading or involuntary. There's a chance that they just are incorrect or the tank was marked captive bred, but someone else put other fish in there in the meantime, and you're not actually getting captive bred. So mm -hmm. it's just, anyway. I got these clowns. There's 11 in there. I think I've had them for four and a half years now. And uh, they, they still squabble, but they're all the same family and I've had no drama. Now, the anemone cube, which is that blue thing in the corner over there, that's got 12 clownfish in it. Wow. They're all oscillaris. The female is orange and she was part of a pair and her mate died. And so she's alone. And then my friend with the 800 gallon reef, she was raising clownfish. And I went to her and said, you know, I want 40 clowns. So she brought me, I don't know, about 16 instead. And uh, we put those in and they were in a little ball, swimming in a ball. Like you always see, it's so neat. I love that. That's something they only do in the beginning. They don't, if they would stay in a ball all the time, it'd be really kind of fun, but they don't do that. They, uh, that's a protective thing they do as they're getting comfortable in their new environment. And then they spread into the anemones and so forth. And what mine did was, and I've told the story a lot of times, but three of the little brand new clownfish swam up to the orange one and kissed her belly. They just like kissed her belly. And she's like, I like you guys. And she accepted them instantly. And she accepted the whole family. And she's actually running the tank still, even though some are about her size. Wow. And they're not orange. They're uh, like cappuccino colored. So okay. they're, uh, but they're, but they've all been together. There was some squabbling. I had to rescue a few. Um, three are living in my frag system. One lived in my refugium for a while by itself because the frag system was attacking the poor little guy too. And then I eventually snuck him back into the tank and they took him back. <laughs> so that was a <laughs> cool experience. But again, it was all, I mean, essentially it was all one group other than the one that was in the tank by itself. And it, the one that was by itself, by the way, I want to point this out. You know, I always, I love to attribute human emotions to fish because that's so logical. And that clownfish would not, come out and she would not eat and she seemed very depressed and when i put in all those clowns she cheered up and she swam everywhere so i feel like she has emotions like me <laughs> <laughs> so when you're at the store you're asking are they captive bred what else should people be asking when they're at that store for the first time whether it's their first or second or third fish what kind of questions should they be asking if you see a fish that you really want to buy, one of the first things I like to ask the store is to feed it in front of me. I want to see it eating oh. because if it's not eating any food and I bring it home and doesn't eat any food, there's a good chance it's not going to work out. So I'd much rather eliminate the possibility that this fish has some kind of internal parasite or just has some weird situation going on that I'm not aware of for, you know, because we don't know exactly where that fish came from. We never know. I wish we knew. Um, and there's been, you know, progress trying to make identifiable trails of, you know, where it went, handing it off, you know, there's been labeling and certifications mm -hmm. and stuff, but it's just not widespread. So we don't know absolutely for sure. And okay, so I want to know that it's eating. I want to look at it. I want to see it swimming around. I want to study its body and look for any kind of flaws, imperfections, attachments that don't belong, which could be flukes or some other kind of disease that's on their skin. I also want to look at the fish system of the store and see how the other fish look, because you could have this one beautiful flame angel swimming around in a tank full of yellow tanks covered in ick. And you're like, well, the flame angel looks clean, so I guess I'll take it. But there's a chance that it could carry that in and put that disease into your tank. And if it's your first fish, every fish you put in afterwards is now exposed. If you have fish and you introduce your new fish, the flame angel, 
and it goes into the tank, it could actually give it to everything and then you could start losing fish. Whoa. And that happens. There's times yeah. when you do everything right and things still don't work out. But there's a lot of times when hobbyists, myself included, will rush something or not go through all the proper steps thinking it's going to be okay. And then usually something goes wrong and you're having to deal with the aftermath and it's 10 times more work. So Mark, once we're at the store and we're, we're watching those fish being fed, um, are, there, are there any telltale signs to tell if it's kind of a dodgy establishment, a dodgy store and something that shouldn't be trusted? I'm a fanatic about clean aquariums. And when I go into a store and if I can't see through the tanks, if they're just covered in stuff and they're dirty inside and algae growing everywhere, I'm not really happy with their husbandry. And I'm not going in there on a rescue mission to save the fish from the store. Yeah. That's not my goal. My goal is to find healthy livestock in healthy environments to put them in my healthy environment. And I feel like if the store isn't looking healthy from top to bottom, if it just has this dirty feel to it, I probably won't spend any money. Or if I do, I buy a test kit or I buy frozen fish food or something that I know is probably safe. <laughs> I mean, if it's really dodgy, like maybe the cooler broke and the frozen food thawed and they refroze it to sell it to me. Oh my God. But I mean, come on, we're looking for like the absolute worst fish store on the planet now. But no, I mean, just walk into a store, you want to just feel good about the employees. You don't want to feel talked down to. You want to be able to ask a question and, and not be mocked. Um, you might even just eavesdrop in other conversations. I like to do that. I, I'll hang out in a fish store and I'm just taking pictures of stuff because it's pretty. And there's an employee talking to a customer. I just kind of listen to the conversation to see if they're accurate. <laughs> you know, are they giving good advice? Is the is the buyer asking the right questions? Sometimes I, I kind of say, you might want to, you know, and I kind of <laughs> give them a little bit of feedback, you know. And there's times where, you know, sometimes, I mean, the fish stores have to make a living. They got to pay for yeah. the electricity. They got to pay for the AC. They got to pay for all the water, the salt, everything, plus the employees, plus the owner, plus the inventory. Um, but... There are times when it seems like they, the sale is more important than the choice. And that concerns me. And I remember watching a guy, an employee, pushing a cart full of goodies that the customer had picked out. He bagged up all these items. And I watched the bag go by and I said, that's a sand sifting starfish. Do you have a reef tank? And he's like, yeah, I can't wait. I'm like, no, not that one. That is not going to reef tank. And the employee like on cue said, you didn't say you had a reef tank. No, I can't sell this to you. And I was just thinking, nice save. I mean, because you know, <laughs> it just felt like he would have sold him that without questions asked. And I've been telling people for a long time that is a bad starfish for a reef tank. And people are going to debate that. And that's okay. They can debate all they want. I'm still right. <laughs> if you look up what a sand sifting starfish eats for a living, and then you look at what the other starfish eat, you'll, you'll decide you'll find out through the facts that is a poor choice that will wipe out all the life in your sand bed. You have a dead, dead sand bed and then you have algae growing on the sand here. Like, why is this happening to me? So there's certain things that you shouldn't have. And like I said, you're still going to have 17 people that are going to say, Oh, I've done it. I've been doing it for 30 years and it's fine, but it's not fine. It's not good advice. And I don't recommend it. So Mark, I have a saying, there's no such thing as your first tank, only your first two tanks, right? First because tank. you're, you, you never just have one tank. You always have that tank and a quarantine tank. Mm -hmm. So when you bring these new animals home, what do you do with them? And what should you have done up until that point? You know, one of the things that I like to recommend, and I haven't done it in a long time, is to keep a constant running quarantine tank around the clock. Just have it running with filtration, top it off every single day or set up a system to automatically top it off and ignore it. And then when you spur of the moment, see a fish store as you're driving home from work and you're like, oh my God, I got to stop in here. And you grab zooanthids and you grab a blue azure damsel and you, <laughs> you get a bottle of, you know, Kent uh, algae gone or whatever it is you want to do. You come home, you have a quarantine tank. You can actually start dealing with this rather than, well, let me acclimate it to my aquarium and drop it in. Because if you don't have that set up, you're probably not going to quarantine. And one of the reasons for quarantine, one of the main reasons for quarantine is to avoid putting any kind of uh, fish disease into your reef tank. The other benefit of quarantine is that fish is by itself, unless you bought a few, they would be by themselves in that small tank and they would be learning the food you offer. They would get a chance to eat it. They would get a chance to smell it. You know, they'd 
they could ignore it. <laughs> I mean, but they're not being attacked by all the other fish you already have that know that food and, and act like the Tasmanian devil that just blasts through the tank trying to get every bite while the new guy's like, what just happened? So you, you want to make sure that your fish is eating. And in a quarantine tank, you can feed many times a day. And then after the food's been in there for like two minutes, if the fish isn't eating it all, you can siphon that out. And that way the water's not becoming super polluted. You don't have problems, another issue to deal with. But no one wants to quarantine. Nobody wants to quarantine. I guarantee you. Now, let me tell you this. Public aquariums, when they get any kind of livestock, fish or corals, and sometimes they get involuntary corals. In other words, they were seized by fish and wildlife, and they, are, they call the public aquarium and say, hey, we have these fish and these corals, and they have to be picked up in the next nine hours or they're dead because they were illegal or they didn't have the right papers or whatever it is. The, suddenly, the facility has to absorb these animals. They weren't even thinking about getting that day when they came to work. So they have to have a trough set up running with filtration actively. And then that livestock that goes in there, most of the aquariums have asked this question of, do it for 45 days before it goes into their ecosystem. So you guys doing a quarantine tank for two or three weeks should be nothing compared to 45 days of looking at something you just got that you can't put in your aquarium yet. And so it is, it's really a good thing to do. Now, what I like to do and like I've done in the past, I didn't do it with this, this tank, and I really should have, but because it's a good example. But in the past, with my previous tank, I had a quarantine tank running all the time. It was a 14-gallon cube. It had live rock in it. That live rock was dedicated quarantine live rock. It was never going to go in my reef, ever, because if I put any kind of medication in that tank, it went into that rock. If, I, you know, if anything went wrong, it went into that rock. That rock was the rock of the quarantine tank. And then you might think, well, why would you put rock in there? because it's natural and the fish feels like home. It doesn't feel natural when you're in the Home Depot section of PVC pipes. And yet somehow these fish use it for shelter and I understand it's cleanable and you can bleach it and all that, but it's very unnatural, it's weird, okay? So I like to set up an, a quarantine tank that has salt water, it has a heater, it has live rock. Uh, that rock may not be as live as I'd like it to be, <laughs> but uh, I keep the salinity at 1.026. I'm not trying to have low salinity to like, eliminate ick, for example, that's a whole other discussion or a whole other second tank, <laughs> third tank, because you said this is the second tank. Um, but you would want to be able to hold these fish and observe them and make sure they look healthy for two or three weeks before they go in your aquarium. And like I said, you're feeding them, you're changing water, you're making sure everything's stable in that tank each day. And you, know, you get to get a good look at that fish because it doesn't have a lot of hiding spots, which is nice too. But then after three weeks have elapsed and you're looking at it, you're thinking, huh, everything's good. I'm ready to rock and roll. You could at that point then move the fish into your reef tank without having as much fear of, I just came home with a bag of water. Who knows what's <laughs> in this water? Hopefully it'll be okay. Because a lot of people do that. They just, they don't think it won't be okay. They just assume the store did everything right. And some stores actually offer quarantining. Some stores absolutely do not. And so you can't expect them to do all the work they are going their job is to move livestock as quickly as they can <laughs> so you got your first couple of fish and you're you're a couple of months in at this point you have four or five things in your tank and you're starting to get antsy again mark oh my gosh you know what i want something more i want something new but potentially i've made the wrong choices so far because i really wanted something that was beautiful but not compatible with everything i want in the future what do i do now yeah, that, for example, let's say you've got this really pretty fish, you came across it and you were like, I've got to own this. For example, a Sohal Tang, very pretty, very aggressive. And uh, you put that in the tank now, it's month number two, which is kind of crazy, but let's just say you did. You will not be able to put in any other fish after that one. <laughs> that fish is the boss of the tank and anything you introduce, it will chase and try to maim because that is its personality. So it would be really good if you did not let that happen. So basically anything that you're thinking about getting aggressive wise, you know, the most aggressive and a lot of fish are labeled. You can look up fish online that you're thinking about buying on Live Aquarius website and they always talk about their temperament and they can tell you if it's semi-aggressive, if it's uh, docile or if it's super aggressive. And if it's super aggressive, that should be your last fish. You just don't want to put those in too soon because you'll end up uh, with 
hostility and anger. And I'll tell you this, this is a weird one. And like I said, I had all these clowns and they all came from the same clutch and all of a sudden they were picking on one or two. And it wasn't just one clown was mad at one clown. It was like nine clowns were mad at one clown. It's a weird anger triggering response and one darts out of the clown. So the other one's like, oh, I got to join in. We got to protect the pack or something. It's, I've seen this happen many times. And I it's never called really a just, school, a school, yeah. Mark, school. <laughs> it's, it's just an angry school. It's mean girls. You know, it's like, what are you doing? And I just feel like that shouldn't, and, you know, matter of fact, when that happened, I didn't have to get met. I just put my hand in the water and that clownfish went into my hand for safety. And I lifted it out and put it in the frag tank and that fish was saved. But I was just like, what is wrong with all of you? <laughs> so when you have one aggressive fish in your tank chasing another fish that may be new, the other fish may join in the fray and they may also attack your new guy, even though normally they wouldn't even care. So there is that situation. That's why it's so important to put the semi-aggressive fish in at the end. The most aggressive fish should go in your tank last. So there's Not a social hierarchy you should be yeah. considering and be concerned about. Yeah. And then, okay. So let's say you have the fish, like you said, I bought this fish It's two months in, I can't do anything else. What do I do? Well, you could take the fish back to the fish store. You could take the fish out of the tank, rearrange all the rock work. So it's all different. So it doesn't have its, um, home range. Yeah. It, it feels like it's, it knows its neighborhood and you just rearranged mm. it all. And then you put the fish back in and it's like, what just happened? And where's my little hole? And I used to chase something yellow. Where is that thing? You know, <laughs> that could happen. Sometimes people will take the fish out and they put it in their sump temporarily um, as a timeout. Mm -hmm. And then they try to reintroduce it later. Uh, you could do something like I've done with all my new fish. Every new fish I ever get goes into Peacemaker, which is an acrylic box that I made. I made one probably 2011 and I put it, I made it for this tank. And it was an acrylic box with a lot of holes drilled in it. And it sits on the top of the Euro bracing so it can't drop in. And the idea was that the fish would be in there. It would get all the water of the tank. It would get the lighting. You could see the neighbors and the neighbors could see it, but there would be no interaction. There'd be no fighting whatsoever. And because here's the weird thing. And, you know, I do a lot of reading and I come across all these little tidbits of information. When you get a brand new fish and you put that new fish in a quarantine tank, it has a few days to dissipate its fear hormone that, that, that thing it's putting out into the water column, the other fish sense. So if you have a quarantine tank with three fish in it and you came home with a new, new fish, it also goes in the quarantine tank. Number one, you got to restart the clock because you introduced a brain new fish that might have pathogen. So you got to do another three week wait minimum. And then the other thing is they may sense that hormone and they think I must attack. It's a weird chemical thing. Like I hate that guy. It's just, it's like, I don't know why I hate him, but boy, do I hate him. And the other guy's like putting out this thing, like, just leave me alone. I'm timid. And they're just like, hate, hate, hate. So it's a weird situation that can happen. And so even if, when you don't use quarantine, uh, the thing I like to recommend is to use safety stop, which is a medicated bath. It takes 45 minutes in part A, 45 minutes in part B. And then I take it out of there and I put it in my peacemaker and it sits in there for three days in the reef tank and everyone can see it. And even if it has that stress hormone coming out, that's telling the other fish to attack it, they can't, they, they may swim around a little bit more hard for a little bit thinking what's in the water, you know, like chum in the water with a shark and blood, <laughs> but they can't quite figure out what it is, but there's nothing to chase because the guy's safe in the box. And then after three days, I will just pour the box, you know, the, the fish out into the reef. And I never have fighting. I've never had anything that I poured out of the box suddenly get chased insanely. Like you do when you get a brainy fish, out of the bag and into the tank. Are you doing that with the lights fully on at the peak of the day? Are you doing that in the evening and the morning? Well, I mean, you buy fish during the daytime almost always. Even if you mm. receive a shipment of fish, it's during when the daytime releasing when them? you receive it. Yeah. And so, when oh, when I release, it's just kind of like, it's been three days. I, okay. I don't really care about the time of day. You could possibly release after lights out, but all the fish that live in the reef already have a spot they call home that they sleep in. And this guy's going to go hold a hold a hold trying to find a spot. And every single one, the guy's like, not mine, That's not right. here, not there. And he's like, I can't even see where I'm going. And I don't know what's available. There's no bunks left. So it's, it's a real problem. And so I, I, mine's during lighting. I like to see the interaction. Also, I feed it a lot. So while it's in that box, I, there's a lid on the top. So it can't jump out. 
and there's a small hole that a pipette would fit in there. And so I thaw out like mini mices or PE mices or whatever food fits the mouth of that fish. And I will thaw some and I will put that bowl in the refrigerator. And every few hours, I'll take a pipette and I squirt it into the box. So the food goes there and the other fish smell it. They're like, oh my God, but there's no food because the little guy got it. And uh, when I feed at night, I feed the whole reef and I put some in the, the box at the same time so it can have some food. But that way everyone's kind of seeing and smelling food. It's not unfair, but I'm making sure that one fish is getting fed for a while. And if you, it was a ras, because people love rasses. <laughs> if you got a ras, uh, one customer recently asked me if I could make a solid bottom on the box instead of a clear box. And I can, I don't like to. And the reason I don't like to is because the whole point of the box is it's crystal clear, the light shines through it, it's not shading the corals underneath it. But in the case of a ras, something else you could do is you could actually put in like this much sand in the bottom of that box and let them, they can't see the bottom. So that's good. And they can sleep in the sand if they need to, or you could put a small container of sand inside the box if it's big enough for it to use as a place to sleep at night. Cause some rasses are, you know, they bury themselves to sleep. When they're looking for these boxes, whether from your site or other sites, is there a certain kind of length or dimension bigger than the fish, obviously that they should be looking at like three times the size of the fish, two, mm -hmm. two times the size of the fish? probably uh with mine i just make a standard size i make it a box that's 12 inches long by six inches wide by eight inches tall and about six and a half inches is underwater because okay. the top part's above the water for the bracing um and in that situation that seems to work for most but you know occasionally i have a customer who says well look mark i'm buying these huge tangs and Big so question. i had to make them a peacemaker 24 inches yeah. long with a divider that looked like a <laughs> guillotine and you put one tang here and one tang here but even then they have to bend their body to turn because there's only, you know, six, seven, eight inches of width. It's not swimming space. It's stay alive mm. space. <laughs> it's not great. But if you've ever been to a uh, wholesaler, I've seen some shocking stuff. I mean. Yeah, well, those fish aren't in there very long, but they do have a lot of flow. And keep in mind, yeah, this isn't a standalone yeah. little tiny tank. This has got all the other flow and all the water yeah. chemistry of your main display. Oh, absolutely. It's part of a huge body of water. So it's not bad filtration, but you walk in there and you see like little tiny cubbies. And they all have a fish. And, I'm, and it's because they don't want these fish to fight and tear up their fins because now they're not as valuable for sale, for example. But I've seen some stuff and I'm just like, holy crap, I can't believe this is how it is. My box is way bigger. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it can, it can enjoy the reef. So uh, it's nice to have that there are different ones on the market. Mine are a little more durable, the quarter inch acrylic. And it's a one piece thing. There's no, there's no moving parts. There's no... Um, People say, well, can I use it as a fish trap? And also, can I use it for this? And can I use it for that? Like, no, it is one job. <laughs> and as long as you don't job. drop it on concrete, it'll last you the rest of your life. Up until this point, they've quarantined every fish. They're putting into their display. They have compatible fish. The fish are getting along. And up until this point, we've mostly been talking about fish. How about yeah. coral? Let's rewind. I'm at the store. I want to buy a coral. What yeah. am I looking for at the coral? What am I looking for from stores that offer coral? Um, okay, so this gets tricky because we always love the most colorful items. And the store would be happy to sell you something vivid. They're happy to do that. I mean, why not? But can your tank support that vivid coral? And you need to actually know what different corals there are. There are softies, there's LPS corals, there's SPS corals, and then there's others that aren't even in those three classifications. And how long you've been in the hobby would dictate which ones you'll probably want to buy. Most people that are new to the hobby, they seem to really enjoy softies. And they're usually pushed toward buying softies, which would be like green star polyps or mushrooms or leather corals. Um, yellow, yellow polyps is another one that used to be around that I haven't seen in forever. Uh, zoanthids are very popular because they come in lots of colors, like little flowers. So you can get all those and but does your tank have the right lighting for it? And some tanks come with a light as part of the <laughs> kit, but is it enough of a light for these corals or is it enough of the light to feed your fish? Because, you know, the fish doesn't need to see a lot and you just need, it needs to be able to see that flake food it's about to go after. But if you put some kind of coral in your tank, will it grow or will it stretch up really long trying to get to the light and turn really pale because it's not getting enough light? So there's some risk there. Also, you want to make sure you have adequate flow in the aquarium, and that could be a, a lack of power heads where you need more power heads for more flow through the system for the corals to stay clean. 
because a lot of these corals have uh, a mucus on their, on their flesh and some of them shed it like leather corals. Others just have it and it kind of needs to kind of slough off just from good flow through the tank. And if you don't, those corals kind of look like they're being webbed, like zoanthids specifically may close up. And now they just look like little nubs. They were pretty flowers and now they're nubs. And they never open. And there's this weird web on top. And you're like, what is this? And you know, you're taking a toothbrush to it or you're taking a turkey baster and blowing it off and it refuses to open. And you're like, what is happening? So does the tank have enough sufficient flow to handle this livestock? Now, since we've talked about you might be new as a hobbyist, you're going to learn more and more and you're going to also ask people questions and you're going to ask the fish store, well, what is that one? That's really nice. And you, know, you need to then write it down and go home and learn about it. Don't just get excited because they told you in three minutes, you'll be fine because that is terrible advice. They don't know your whole ecosystem. They definitely don't know the age of your ecosystem. They don't know your husbandry habits. They don't know that you actually turn the light on each day and turn it off. Sometimes you forget. They don't know that you only top off every four days because the water got down this far and the filter is too noisy now. I mean, there's so many things they don't know. And they're just assuming you're doing everything right. So you need to do the homework. But I can tell you this. Most people that get those corals in the beginning, when they upgrade their tank later, they never get those corals again. Because all those softies, those really interesting, fast-growing corals are considered weeds by everyone else that's been in the hobby a long time. And we don't want star pops. We don't want mushrooms. We don't want leathers. We don't want zinnia. I mean, we, there's just so many different ones we don't want because they take up a ton of space and you have no room to plant the stuff that you really like. So it's okay to learn with softies. There's nothing bad about them. And there's a lot of people out there that, just, that makes them completely content. They see them like pulsing zinnia. They're a flower that does this. And it's so pretty. It's mesmerizing. And some people just like to look at it and just, they just stare at that all day long and, and it makes them super happy. And, they're, and they don't want anything else, but others want clams or they want a uh, peppermint shrimp or they want an arrow crab or they want a uh, serpent starfish or they might want an octopus. Or, I mean, there's so many different creatures out there that people like to include in their aquariums other than just fish. And so we need to make sure that the tank can handle it, that you are taking good care of the aquarium, that you are testing your water every single week to make sure that the water parameters aren't shifting and adjusting whatever you need to, to add a little bit more of this element or that element so that it maintains the same number on a regular basis, because that will then let you start having nicer and nicer corals. And I got to tell you this, because it would be unfair not to tell you this, the nicest corals you ever find, the ones that are super expensive, when things go wrong, are the first to die. <laughs> Everything else will survive, but that one that cost you five hundred dollars will be gone. So, and I'm not trying to scare you away with a five hundred dollar coral. That's crazy talk. I don't like spending that kind of money. I think the most I've ever spent on a coral. I walked into a fish store, and I saw this one coral, and it just my eyeballs did the thing like the cartoons or burst out of my head. <laughs> and I said, I don't care what that costs, I'll take it. And so he said, No problem. He bagged it up, and I got to the register, and I'm reaching into my wallet. And he, hands me, he tells me $350 and he's adding tax. I'm like, $350? I mean, you know, it's nice, but is it $350 nice? And I just bought it. I was like, all right, I'm going to do it. So what that Oof. was, was that was a rainbow wells affilia. It was a beautiful coral. And I probably had it 18 months. And then one day it just started shrinking, shrinking, shrinking. And there was nothing I could do to stop. And it was gone. But I got to enjoy it for 18 months. So there was a little tiny bit of silver lining. But that was the most expensive coral I've ever bought. Well, wow, that's nuts. So uh, to recap, a good store should be asking you not only what kind of tanks and lighting and flow you have, but you should be looking at the tanks and lighting and flow the store has. Yeah. Yeah. And then yeah, definitely you... that. And we Sorry. want to make sure we have more test kits than what they usually use in the store. Most stores tend to focus on the, the initial four because they're selling fish. And so they care about ammonia, nitrite, nitrate, ammonia. Uh, what else? Salinity. salinity, right? Yeah. And uh, when it comes to corals, we care about alkalinity, calcium, magnesium, potassium, uh, <laughs> and some other elements that are so important and should not be ignored. And just buying bottles of all the flavors and pouring that in your tank each week doesn't necessarily mean you're putting in the right elements. So we want to make sure that we have test kits to measure what we can, try and ever to overdose anything that is um, an additive. For example, okay, 
let's say you are trying to correct something in your tank, you care about your corals, you, you've spent money, you, you've been at this for a while, and you find out that something has gone wrong and your alkalinity has become too low. You read the bottle, you do the homework, you crunch the math and you say, I need 91 milliliters of this liquid to fix my problem. You don't have to put in 91 milliliters is what I'm trying to tell you. All Instead, at once, no? <laughs> <laughs> no. Instead, I would rather you take half of that and maybe mix it with some water, some RO water or something, and pour that in your tank gradually in an area of really high flow so it really mixes. And then wait a day, check again, and then maybe add the other half of what that initial dose was. You don't have to put it all in the same day. You don't have to put it all in the same minute. You could do a half in the morning and check that afternoon and say, okay, put the other half in. But that way you're adjusting your tank without cooking anything and making a mistake. Now I'm gonna amend my earlier saying, I think there's no such thing as your first tank, only your first three tanks, Mark, because your invertebrate quarantine system should be different than your vertebrate quarantine system because potentially what you're treating your vertebrates with will just kill all your brand new coral. Yeah, uh, now I'll tell you, for me, I, I don't buy a lot of fish. I, I get some fish and I'm kind of done. And uh, then I go nuts with corals for like the next few years because fish, they kind of live forever. I mean, that's the plan, right? You don't want to get a fish that's only gonna be with you a brief period. So like, you know, I had a, a purple tang with me since 2004 and I just lost it a month ago. But I mean, that's a super long time for having one fish. And I actually have a Nassau tang that's still with me since 2004 still alive. So that's good. I've got yellow tangs. What? Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're doing the Spock sign. Yeah, that's Spock. So I mean, there's different fish will live different lifespans. And I remember reading Coral Magazine, which is a great publication. I highly recommend it to anyone. <laughs> that's Why is that, Mark? <laughs> the uh, Coral Magazine had an article about yellow tangs out of Hawaii. And one of the things that caught my eye in one of the many articles was that they studied one and like the cheek spines or something taught them that this fish lived 35 years. I had no idea yellow tanks lived to be 35. I mean, never knew. I, I don't know what I thought, but I never thought it was that long. So if you get a yellow tang and some clownfish, clownfish are known to live 25, 30 years as well. You know, these are long-term pets. Then really, once you've got the fish, you only need invertebrates. You only need the corals now. And so you don't need to keep adding new fish unless there is something lacking. So sometimes we want a new fish because we need one splash of color that's not in the tank. Like you might say, I really, you know, I mentioned yellow. I need a yellow fish. I, something, everything here is not yellow. I need a yellow to kind of change it up. So you kind of look at what yellow fishes exist and find what fits your aquarium that's gonna fit a small tank or what would fit in a big tank, you know, to choose the ideal fish for your system. And, uh, but, and so you were saying about the quarantine. So my quarantine ran all the time and I was always putting corals in it. But if I end up getting a fish, I did put it in that tank. But then after the fish was done, it wasn't like I was getting corals again a week later. It could be months before I get another one. So even if there had been a fish in there for a while, the life cycle of ick is not gonna last months without a fish in there. So I'm thinking it, of the basically. treatment methods, you're dosing with copper or something yeah. like that. That's the potential. And see, I wouldn't do that in a quarantine tank. That's a hospital tank. Uh, oh, okay. There's <laughs> so a fourth and tank. fifth tank right there. <laughs> yeah, I know. But I did tend to do fish in the quarantine tank, or if I wasn't doing fish, I did corals. Sometimes those fish and corals at the same time. And I would just leave them alone, ignore them. I remember I came home once on it. Okay, I'm at a frag swap. That's another place you can buy things, right? Sometimes you can buy fish at a frag swap. Sometimes you're buying corals, sometimes dry goods. And I was at this frag swap in Florida and I'm just walking around. I was a speaker. So I'm just kind of killing time and looking at stuff. And this one vendor had on his table a very skinny, long plastic bag. Okay. But very skinny, like two inches wide and about that tall. And it was a purple Gorgonian. Wow. And it's a really pretty coral from Florida. And he had several of them. And I was like, because, you know, you in Texas, you buy a frag, it's going to be about this tall. You might get a piece of gorgonian on a frag plug and eventually it might look like a coral <laughs> and here was this full thing and i was like how much is that and he said five dollars like are you kidding me oh my god and so that was the beginning of the end for me that day because now i bought that i start shopping everywhere and i came home with 25 corals that day <laughs> so i had to put them all somewhere when i got home i floated them in the quarantine tank i released them in the quarantine tank and that was it that tank has its own light. 
it has filtration, it has the live rock, it has a heater. And my job was just kind of observe things. And then when I was ready, I would take corals out and I would dip them in a chemical that kills any kind of pests. I'd study them very carefully and then I'd plant them in my reef tank. And that is, so that's how sometimes you end up with way too many corals accidentally. Or you might have it where someone contacts you and says, I'm breaking down my tank, I'm moving away. I have all these corals. And again, you don't know what pests were in their tank. So you wanna put theirs in a quarantine. So if you have one running, you can handle these things. But if you don't have one running, you can't put them in there. You can't just suddenly set it up and be okay. The corals will just die. The fish will just die. They, they need to, it needs to be an established tank. So having it running all the time is ideal. And as long as you just maintain salinity by keeping it topped off, it can, and that piece of live rock, it'll just kind of take care of itself, in my opinion. Now to wrap things up, are there any kind of considerations about compatibility with corals that people should consider? Compatibilities with corals. Well, you may have certain fish that you like that like some of the corals that you like too. <laughs> so for example, hippo tangs, the dory tang, very popular fish. A lot of people like to get them. And a lot of people like zoanthids and hippo tangs chow down on zoanthids. They bite at them. They may move them. Um, they may destroy them. So you have to then decide what do you care about more? Do you care about dory or do you care about the zoanthid? Because if you're into zoanthids, you're not going to want that fish. And so that fish needs to get its own tank or it needs to go back to the fish store or it has to go to another hobbyist that doesn't have zoanthids. And that way you're kind of dealing with the compatibility. Uh, another one that oftentimes happens is dwarf angels don't always do play well with corals. And so I remember I bought a uh, beautiful Montepore digitata. It was brown with blue polyps. It's called a German blue digitata. And I bought this piece from the fish store and I came home and I stuck it in my tank and the next day it was bone white. And I was so mad. I went back to the store and said, you ripped me off. You gave me a bad coral because I was really dumb. And uh, he said, <laughs> what are you talking about? I was like, no, you owe me a coral. And I was really upset. And so he said, I'm going to give you one more, but I'm never doing this again. <laughs> and I was like, fine. And I left with my coral and I put it in the exact same spot. And the next day I'm looking and my flame angel is going pow, 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 pow. It was eating all the polyps. So I was like, oh, that wasn't his fault at all. <laughs> so sometimes you may have a fish that eats corals you care about. You have to acknowledge that as a possibility. These fish don't always read the books that we read. Don't always oh. believe the things we believe. And they're going to do what they want because that is their home. What about coral proximity to other corals? I like to have space between corals because they are going to grow and become larger and they're going to become closer friends without you liking that. And you're going to have to frag them from time to time to create some space or actually relocate one further apart. Certain corals are so aggressive, so aggressive in growth. I actually recommend they be by themselves on a rock, on the sand, by the, you know, way away from everything. So they can't spread to every piece of your rock work because then you have nowhere else to put other corals. Well, thank you very much, Mark, for being here today at MACTA 2021, speaking about, I want to stock my aquarium. How do I start? Mark, do you have any final words for your presentation? I feel like there was about 10,000 things I didn't tell you, but I hope this helped just a little bit. Thank you very much. If you have a question for Mark, you can go to macna.org slash questions. And I'm sure Mark will be around at the end of the day. He'll be around for all of MACNA. I think he's going to be... Uh, <laughs> well uh well lubricated by the end of the day <laughs> that's for sure he sent me a photo of his uh, drink of choice for the weekend thank you very yeah. much mark <laughs> thank you